and a very good afternoon to everyone. Um, and the first thing I always say when talking about bull selection, or indeed ram selection, is that it isn't easy to identify animals by physical appearance alone. The way an animal looks at a bull sale is greatly influenced by his age and his feeding and the farm that he's come from, as well as his genetics. And we really need an objective way to tease out uh, the differences between the environment and an animal's genetic merit. That's certainly true when it comes to growth and carcass traits. And there's good examples of bulls in the past that have looked fantastic, but have not actually gone on and bred well uh, in terms of their progeny. Uh, but it's absolutely vital when it's traits that you can't see. So traits like ease of carving or the fertility of a bull's daughters. We can line bulls up in a show ring all day long and it will tell us nothing about those attributes. So those are things where having objective performance records is really important. I think there's probably about a thousand pedigree herds up and down the country that are actively involved in performance recording with a whole different range of breeds that are involved. Primarily, there's a couple of different systems of data analysis that are available. There's the Breed Plan uh, Genetic Evaluation Service, so for breeds like the Simmental and the Charolais and the Hereford, uh, will be involved in using Breed Plan. Signet Performance Records, certainly some numerically smaller breeds, but also the Stabilizer uh, cattle population, which is actually a fair chunk of cars registered with us each year. And then there's also breeds that record directly with eGenes, who are SRUC's genetic analysis service. So the Limousin Cattle Society would be an example that sits in that camp. But broadly speaking, the genetic analysis services are very, very similar. We're all trying to achieve the same thing. I guess the subtle differences, perhaps, are the way that the contemporary groups are formed when comparing animals, and also the overall breeding indexes that are created. But uh, for the purposes of today's talk, the estimated breeding values uh, are very similar between the different genetic analysis services. Uh, each service really relies on two bits of, of data. One is pedigree information, so that we know about the relationship between animals, and so that we can track genetic differences and changes over time through the pedigree. And then the other bit is the performance data. So information about ease of birth, uh, calving ease, weight records taken roughly every 90 to 100 days uh, through an animal's life, up to about 600 days of age, and then measurements of muscle depth and fat depth using ultrasound scanning. This data is analysed using a statistical procedure referred to as BLUP, and that data analysis uh, teases out the environmental influences uh, such as uh, differences between herds, feeding effects, the age of mum, the age of the calf, the sex of the calf, so that what we're left with is the true genetic differences between animals. And these genetic differences that are teased out are the things we refer to as estimated breeding values, or EBVs. The next thing we need to think about are which estimated breeding values are important, and there's actually a whole plethora of breeding values that are available to beef producers. The key bit is to home in on those that are going to make the biggest financial difference to your particular herd. So I spend lots of time with farmers that maybe are excited about improving carcass traits or topping the market. Um, but actually, sometimes when you drill down and look at their performance, the areas that they're weaker on is actually a number of live uh, calves sold over a specific period of time or getting cows back in calf, or they have costs associated with cow mature size um, that they could actually uh, try, try to optimize for their unit. So it's really important to sit down and have a long, hard think about your enterprise when uh, setting up breeding goals. The main EBVs can be split into roughly three areas. Uh, those influencing ease of calving, those influencing growth and carcass traits, and those influencing maternal performance. So what I'm going to do is talk about the, the first two sets before we stop for questions, as they tend to be the most important when it comes to selecting a, a terminal sire bull where all the progeny will be sold for slaughter. So the traits influencing ease of calving, well, they will include birth weight, so that enables producers to select for slightly smaller calves at birth, because we know that slightly smaller calves will be born more easily. They can select
select for a carving ease EBV. So that enables the selection of bulls whose calves will be born more easily. And they can also select for a gestation length EBV. So that enables the selection of bulls that will have slightly shorter gestation length because, again, we know that's going to lead to slightly smaller calves that are going to tend to be born slightly more easily. And you can probably see that between those three traits, there's actually a fairly close uh, relationship. As birth weight increases, calving ease tends to decrease. Uh, and by measuring both, we, we get a much better handle on a, a bull's overall ease of calving. It also shows the other challenge that we face, that when we select for improvements in growth rate or improvements in muscling, you tend to get an increase in birth weight and you tend to get a decrease in calving ease. So while in many breeds we can be very proud of the genetic progress we've made in improving growth and carcass traits, there's been a tendency in years gone by for actually to get a small deterioration in ease of calving, and that's something that's important to be aware of when it comes to selecting uh, bulls, because at the end of the day, if you don't have a live calf, you don't have anything at all. So moving on from traits influencing ease of calving, we also have traits influencing growth rate uh, and carcass attributes. So there are EBVs for 200, 400, and 600 day weight that enable us to select for faster growing cattle, and also cattle that have the potential to be taken to higher weights. We have muscle depth or muscle area EBVs. Now, that subtle difference just depends on which analysis service you're using. Signet tends to use muscle depth. Uh, breed plan will tend to use muscle area, but essentially it's trying to uh, do the same thing and identify animals with superior muscling and thus better carcass conformation. And also we have EBVs for fat depth. Now, the fat depth EBV is one of those traits where really we're probably needing to think about an optimum, and an optimum that will depend on the type of farm that you have, your production system, and the type of cows that you're using. Certainly, if you're struggling to get carcasses to a heavy enough weight, particularly for heifers, without being penalised for them being over fat, then you've got the ability to select bulls that are going to be genetically leaner, uh, and so you've got a tool that will help in that respect. But also, if you've actually got lots of very fast growth rate and high levels of muscling, but you're concerned about getting, uh, ensuring that animals are within spec in terms of carcass weight, then you can select for positive fat depth EBVs to make sure that animals are finished quickly and, and at the ideal carcass weight for your system. So you've got the ability to, uh, to make some changes there in, in terms of the fat depth EBV. So those are the, the traits that, that we have available to us. And there's good evidence of the financial benefits that can be attributed to the estimated breeding values. So trials at Half for Adams, for example, using both Limousin and Aberdeen Angus bulls in the past, have regularly shown benefits of 30 to 40 pounds a calf due to the benefits of having high EBV sires. Now, that's not just in terms of improvements in, uh, in carcass weights or growth rate, um, but it's also due to reductions in finishing times, so uh, cattle that are produced more efficiently and cost less money to produce. Now, if you multiply this up over a bull's working lifetime, that could easily be worth an extra £5,000, which is actually a fantastic return on investment, uh, more than justifying any small additional investment to actually get the right bull for your particular herd. So there's a, a really good case for, for investing in bulls with superior EBVs for these traits. Sarah, is this a, a good point to see if there's any questions that have come through? Yes, we can do if you'd like to break there. Um, so thank you, Sam. While I just wait for questions to come in, I'd just like to remind everyone that there are additional resources available on the AHDB Beef and Lamb website on EBVs. So these include a BRP manual on fit for purpose bulls and a BRP plus on breeding female replacements from the suckler herd. So these can be found in the better return section of the website. So we've just got one question in um, asking how important the gestation length EBV is when selecting a bull. Okay. Gestation length is an interesting one because it's a measurement that we won't tend to get on all animals. Uh, it will be picked up using AI service dates 
that are submitted through to breed societies so that you, you know with a high degree of accuracy when the animal was served and then when she calved down. Um, so I always have a little bit of a look at the accuracy figures for that trait because that will tell me how much data is behind an animal's mm. record. But it, it is important, and particularly in either mating heifers, where a shorter gestation length is going to be quite useful in getting a, a calf that's born slightly sooner and, and slightly smaller, but also actually within the dairy sector. If people are looking for beef bulls to use on dairy cows, you've got the opportunity to um, use bulls with slightly shorter gestation length, which means the cow will be back in milk sooner uh, and hence uh, returning more money to, to yeah. the farming system. And just a question here about calving ease. So is there a relationship between calving ease direct and calving ease daughters? There is a, a small relationship in, in the background. Um, this would be one of the, the more complicated traits to understand. Uh, calving ease direct is the ease with which a bull's calves will be born. And maternal calving ease, which we'll touch upon in a moment, is the ease with which uh, a cow will actually calve down herself. Now, in theory, if you've got a, a slightly narrower calf that's born more easily, if that's a heifer calf, when she grows up to be a cow, if she's slightly narrower, she can have a narrower pelvis and be slightly more difficult calving herself yeah. when she becomes a mum. So, from the work that I've seen, it's not a massive, massively strong antagonism, but there's right. a small antagonism between the two, and they do mean subtly different things. So I would advise anybody that's actually looking to breed female replacements to have a look at both traits to ensure that calves are born easily, but also yeah. so that the mums of the future calve down easily themselves. Yeah, so just try and get a happy medium somewhere between Absolutely. those two. Absolutely. Yeah. And just one final question. Um, how can you compare the performance of cattle reared in different herds? Oh, that's a good one, um, and that's a, a question that's frequently raised. The way we're able to do that is that uh, we tend to have good genetic linkage between herds, um, particularly there's quite a bit of AI used in the beef industry. So in many circumstances, you'll have an AI bull that's been used in a whole variety of herds. He'll have uh, a progeny in those different herds, and effectively they, they all share half their genes in common. So if you've got a herd where the calves are all, let's say, 30 kilos lighter than those in another herd, and you've yeah. used exactly the same bull, the analysis can actually tease that out and say, well, hang on, they, you know, they share their genes in common, we expect them to perform in a different way, they're not doing, and so that must actually be a, a feeding effect that's crept yeah. in the difference, and, and that's taken into account. And it, it actually works quite well. Um, to the point that you will occasionally see bulls that look fantastic at an event and actually have very poor EBVs. And when you delve a little bit deeper into the data, you can actually see that the whole of the contemporary group was absolutely massive and that it's very much a farm feeding effect. And, uh, and the converse is true as well. You'll occasionally see animals with very high EBVs actually that don't seem to be particularly heavy at any moment in time. Mm. And again, when you delve a little bit deeper and you look at the contemporary group, you can see that there were calves there by a whole range of sires. They all tended to be somewhat lighter, but actually the genetics of those sires are well known and understood uh, to be mm. high-performing animals. And so you can identify that that's a, a much lo lower input system, perhaps with a bit more forage going in but the genetics uh, will breed true. It's a good prediction of their genetic merit. So am I right in thinking then that herds can't obtain higher EBVs just by feeding more concentrates? No, that, that's a, a bit of a, a common misconception that mm. people can uh, sort of fiddle the figures through feeding. Uh, providing all the animals in a contemporary group are fed in exactly the same way, then we make a comparison across the group and they can either be all fed a lot or all fed a smaller amount and we can make that comparison across the group. The key bit is that contemporary groups do need to be accurately recorded so that we know if animals have been treated the same or if you've got a group that are heading up to the sterling sales and another group that are run commercially that you actually record those differently so we can pick up the difference. That's the sort of thing that would be picked up by your scanning technician when he comes out to see you as well. Right, and I've just got one final question come in. 
Um, somebody's just asking, should you measure heifer pelvic size to counter calving ease problems? Oh, that's a good one. Um, the jury's slightly out on that one. There's, there's been a few papers that I've looked at and read. The challenge is getting a really good repeatability for the measurement um, right. for that trait. That they've shown that with different operators going in and measuring at different points in time, it is quite a tricky um, trait to measure repeatedly and accurately. Within the Suttler Cow Project, which was about 10 years ago, we sent a lot of well-trained technicians out onto farms to take these measurements. And the genetic component that actually came back from taking hundreds and thousands of measurements is that uh, you know, actually the, the heritability, the genetic component to that is relatively low. There would be some units, uh, particularly in the States, big units, that would use it as a sort of an independent culling tool. Yeah. They would go in and measure all the heifers, and then they'd say, well, actually, these ones below a, a pelvic area of X um, could give us trouble, so we'll actually uh, cull those and, and get rid of those. But what mm -hmm. I would say is if you were going to do that, you need to make sure that all the heifers are of a similar age and weight and breed, yeah. because that will have a huge impact on those measurements. And in reality, if you do do that, you will also cull some animals that were perfectly capable of producing calves, sort of uh, false positives, so to speak. So th there's a bit of, it's a bit of a crude tool in that yeah. respect. Yeah. I think what I would tend to do is to say what we'll actually measure is is the ease with which the animals give birth, and we can then use that as a bit of a proxy for all of the genes that influence the ease of calving in mum uh, and in, in the calf itself. Lovely. And I promise this is the final question before we go into part two. Sorry. Um, I've just a question asking. One of the societies does not include the birth weight in the calving value. They only include the gestation length and calving ease, EBV. How important is the birth weight? Ah, that's a good question. Yes, you're right. Um, in the calving value, there's a direct weighting placed on calving ease because we know the economic value of um, a, a calf being born dead or being lost, and we know the economic cost of a difficult calving of the cow. And equally, we can put an economic value on extended gestation length. But, and, and birth weight is more difficult. However, birth weight is closely correlated to um, ease of calving, and it's closely correlated to birth weight. So we are taking that into account within the calving value. We just do it indirectly through the correlations to the other two traits. Effectively, if you weighted birth weight as well, I think you'd almost be double counting birth weight because you'd take into account that the calf is bigger and, and the cost of that. And you'd also be taking into account the fact that it's going to cause difficult calvings. So to avoid double counting, a weighting is just placed on gestation length and calving ease, but birth weight is very important uh, as a measurement that actually underpins both of those as well as the birth weight TBV directly. Lovely, thank you, Sam. That's very well explained. If you'd just like to go on to part two, that'd be lovely. Thank you. I happened to notice the questions were gradually getting more and more difficult, so I was wondering how <laughs> to draw, draw a line at that point. <laughs> Yeah, imagine what they're going to be like after the next section. <laughs> That's what I'm getting nervous about. Okay, well, we'll see, where we, see where we go from there. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about selecting for maternal traits. Uh, so when selecting a bull to breed female replacements, life is certainly a lot more complicated. Most of the traits that I've talked about earlier are of importance, but equally there's a lot of other maternal traits that will be expressed by the heifers and cows coming through. And they tend to have a much lower heritability. So the genetic component within those traits tends to be much smaller. Uh, they're obviously only expressed in female relatives, so you can only collect half as much data. And for some of them, you have to wait quite a long time for those traits to be assessed. So uh, longevity, for example, is, is more difficult to predict because we need to, to wait for animals to actually express that trait over their lifetime. However, these traits also have quite a high economic importance, and it would be very misleading to ignore them. 
and also they'll influence the herd for many years. So the maternal traits that you breed in with your bull will then stay within the cows and their daughters, and so you're going to see them for many years. Uh, and I suppose it's also worth highlighting that it takes time for these traits to be expressed. So the decision that you make today is probably going to be influencing the maternal performance of the herd in about seven, eight, nine years' time, once the bull's calves have been born, have grown up in the herd, and become daughters themselves. So if, if you've uh, selected a bull where there's a problem in terms of the maternal attributes, then actually that's going to be a major headache for you uh, in, the, in the years to come, and actually for several years. So a bit of time getting it right is quite important. The EBVs that are routinely available uh, would include maternal calving ease. So that's a trait we've, we've already talked about quite a bit. That's the ease with which a cow gives birth. And what I would say for that trait is there's quite a bit of variation uh, between breeds in the amount of genetic variation between animals. So if you've got a breed where actually there isn't very much genetic variation out there, uh, then it, it's probably less important to focus on that trait than if you've got a breed where there's massive great variation uh, within that population. There's a 200-day uh, milk EBV. Now, that's the maternal component of 200-day weight. So that's all about identifying bulls whose daughters will uh, produce more milk. So what we do there is we take the 200-day weight of the calf, and through the analysis, we can actually tease out not just the genes from mum and from dad that have gone on and influenced the growth of that calf, but also the genes from mum that influenced how well she looked after that calf of which milk and also maternal care is quite a big component. We have a longevity EBV. Uh, that's probably more correctly described as productive lifespan because we know about when animals have been born and we also know about when they go on and, and produce uh, calves during their breeding life. And that's a way of identifying breeding lines which will go on and have the potential to last longer in the herd so you've got the opportunity to lower replacement costs, and that has quite a high economic value. And the last one, but probably the one that's increasing in, in importance, is cow mature size. Now, this is a really interesting trait, because the challenge we have is that as we select for increases in calf growth rate, then cow mature size is going to tend to increase over time. This creates some great economic benefits for calf finishers, but it equally it comes at a cost to the efficiency of the suckler herd. As the cows tend to get bigger, then they're going to cost more to keep. Uh, you're going to tend to get a lower stocking density. And under a harsh environment, if the cows need to eat more to maintain body condition, and they don't maintain that body condition, then you've got uh, you know, the chance that you're going to have greater fertility problems creeping in. So it's quite important within our breeding female replacements in our suckler herd to have a think about what's the optimum cow mature size uh, for, our, for a particular farming system. And on some units, particularly upland units, a more moderately framed cow uh, could perhaps be stocked more heavily and, and could help increase output. The challenge we have is that calf growth rates are measured very regularly and very accurately by breeders up and down the country. Uh, the measurements of cow mature size tend to be much more limited. I, I imagine it would vary between breeds. I know we do a lot of work with stabilizer cattle, getting a lot of measurements in there. That's one of their big focuses at the moment. But I suspect in some of the other breeds, uh, that there's less of those measurements coming through into the analysis. But if you don't measure it, then you can't actually monitor it and you can't use it as a useful breeding tool. So, talk to us about I'll, uh, sorry, EBVs. I'll talk a little bit more about the breeding indexes. So the challenge with all this information for the beef producers is trying to decide which of the traits they should prioritize within their system. And I guess I've already talked about the fact that you need to think about your individual farm uh, and think about the things that will have the greatest economic importance on that unit. From there, you can look at the breeding indexes uh, which have been developed. And these are aim to pull together the individual EBVs into an overall breeding goal.
So for breed plan recorded breeds, uh, there would commonly be a terminal sire index. Now that takes into account both the growth and the carcass traits, and also those traits influencing ease of carving. So they'll all be combined and taken into account at the same time to rank bulls according to their overall terminal sire characteristics. And there's also a self-replacing index. So that takes into account growth and carcass traits, traits influencing ease of carving, but also traits influencing maternal performance. So it's accounting for the value of the genes that will be expressed in the heifer replacements that are retained in the herd. So for herds where you're looking to keep females, but you'll also have uh, bulls and steers going for slaughter, then the self-replacing index is built to do that job. Those are the two breed plan uh, breeding indexes. For signet recorded breeds, there tends to be a series of sub-indexes, and these include the beef value, which purely identifies animals with superior growth and carcass traits, the calving value, which identifies bulls with superior genes for, for ease of calving, so it's got those elements of gestation length and calving ease going in there, and then the maternal value, so that pulls together those traits influencing uh, maternal performance, performance of the females. And then those are all pulled together into an overall maternal production value, which will put in the appropriate weightings for the growth and carcass, ease of calving, and maternal traits uh, to, tr to try and create that overall balance. But it also means producers can, can pick the figures apart to ensure that they have the right emphasis for their particular system. So, Breeding indexes are a great overview to identify elite animals, and if you're going to a sale, you can quickly home in on those that might be of interest. But I would always say to people, look at the individual EBVs to ensure the bull has the right balance of figures for your particular uh, farming system. Now, there's another piece of information that's published alongside every EBV and every breeding index, and that's the accuracy value. Now, these values, which range between zero, meaning we know nothing, and, and sort of up to sort of 100, which in theory would mean we know everything we can about this animal's genetic merit, um, they're a, an indicator of how close the estimated breeding value is to the true breeding value of that particular animal. So animals with very high accuracy figures tend to have EBVs that will move much less and are much closer and are better predictors of the animal's true breeding potential. Accuracy values tend to be quite similar and are naturally lower for young bulls, which haven't uh, been progeny tested, um, although you can use them to highlight whether an animal's actually been performance recorded for a particular trait uh, or not, or whether the EBVs are perhaps based purely on parental averages uh, alone, or possibly you'll have sires that have come in from overseas and again, they will tend to have lower accuracy values until we actually know something about their progeny. And then accuracy values will increase and will tend to be more useful uh, if you're looking at semen from older bulls. So particularly if you're very interested in maternal traits, then the accuracy values can be used to indicate how widely a bull has been tested and how many daughters have actually been measured for traits such as milk or lifespan, for example. So... It's a useful indicator of, of risk in the background. Uh, bulls are equally likely to move up or to move down in terms of their EBVs, but if you, you want them to perform exactly the way that you expect, then, uh, then you would tend to look for animals with very, very high accuracies in the background. The next thing we should talk about a little bit is where can you find this information? So probably quite self-explanatory that most of the major bull sales will put this information into their sales catalogues. Um, the breeding information will also be provided by the breeders who can print off charts and tables and take them to bull sales. But it's also worth highlighting that the information is very much in the public domain. So through breed society websites or through the Signet Breeding Services website in some examples, you can go and log on and put in an animal's UK number and very quickly bring up his, his breeding values. Uh, and uh, you also have search facilities on those websites that will enable you to perhaps put in your criteria in terms of growth, or ease of carving, or milk, 
and it will make recommendations of, of bulls that will actually meet that criteria and show you whereabouts in the country they are. And while we talk a lot about the information being available online on laptops, of course we should also remember that it's readily accessed through um, things like smartphones. So very often now I'll be standing in the middle of a field and if we can read an animal's UK number, we can actually bring up its breeding information there and then. So that's very useful. To aid with the interpretation of EBVs, it's important to get hold of a brief benchmark. So that tells you what's average or top 25% or top 10% for a particular breed and enables you to put the EBVs in context and also to show how much variation there is out there within a breed. That type of information is commonly put into the front of uh, sales catalogues but can also be obtained through a breed society. Um, and I suspect it will be on, on many websites it is readily available. A really straightforward way of looking at the data is through the use of breeding charts. So these sale charts are a great way of presenting EBVs. What we do there is we actually plot the midline on the chart to represent the average performance of the population, and then any bars to the right tending to indicate superior levels of performance. Although we need to be a little bit careful with that because for traits like fat depth or cow mature size, for example, there's more likely to be an optimum value and an extreme value to the right doesn't necessarily, in that circumstance, represent the economically most advantageous um, uh, trait for that particular animal. But the charts are a great way to quickly glance at an animal's um, breeding potential and you can see where it sits within the breed for its growth traits or its ease of calving traits, for example. So that's a really useful piece of information. Sarah, I was going to stop for some questions there, but I've just got one more uh, bit. I just want to talk about hybrid figure, if that's okay. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Go ahead. So I've talked quite a lot about traits that uh, are easy to select for within a breed, for which we have estimated breeding values uh, that we're able to change. But the sort of final bit of the jigsaw that you can also exploit in a breeding program is through hybrid figure. Now, hybrid figure is when you crossbreed uh, two animals together of a different breed, and the actual level of performance that you get is over and above the average of those two breeds. So it's an extra level of performance that intuitively you wouldn't expect just from crossing those two breeds. It's effectively the reverse of inbreeding. Uh, so the crossbreeding uh, tends to influence those traits that are most badly affected by uh, inbreeding. It doesn't have a huge impact on growth and carcass traits directly, but it has a massive impact on things like longevity or cow fertility and health and vigor. And it's really useful in those particular areas. So if those are the things that are a major concern within your suckler herd and you've got a purebred population, then actually thinking about putting another breed into the mix might be a really good way of actually lifting performance. Um, in, in that particular example. So to give the fullest picture of, of breeding strategies, we've got some really useful EBVs available to us for selecting within a breed, but we should also not forget about uh, the use of, of crossbreeding and, and hybrid vigor um, because that can be used to enhance performance as well. Sarah, over to you. Lovely, thank you for that, Sam. So whilst I wait for some more questions to come in, I'd just like to promote a couple of events which are coming up. So we have a Reducing Calving Difficulties and Improving Calf Survival event, which actually Sam will be speaking at. Um, this is in County Durham and Cumbria on the 11th of February, Nottingham on the 17th of February, and Oxfordshire and Wiltshire on the 18th of February. We also have a webinar on Cryptosporidium in Calves on the 17th of February, so this is a joint webinar by AHDB Beef and Lamb and AHDB Dairy, and it will include a presentation, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions relating to the topic and management of young stock. So that's on Friday, sorry, on the 17th of February in the evening. You can also find uh, more details about these events on the website, which is beefandlamb.ahdb.org.uk. Bookings can be made by phoning the Beef and Lamb Events Office on 01904 77 
or you can alternatively email the events team, which is brp.events.ahdb.org.uk. So the first question, Sam, is yeah. why go as far as 200 days for milk yield and not, say, 100 days in which milk is more important? Gosh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's been modelled a few times, and they've actually had a look at it and uh, and made recommendations. Um, I suppose you've got the challenges of weighing calves at that slightly younger age, and that you've got a little bit more variation that's going to creep in between animals. Um, and so I think it's been looked at at, at various different points. And, and 200, I suspect the correlation between the two might well be quite close so that you'd get a similar answer between the two. Um, but it, it's a good question. Um, but I, I think it's been modelled in the past, and that's been shown to be uh, be fairly standard. It's interesting that I think we're using a similar age in breeding evaluations across the world. So I don't think we're unusual in using 200 days. Lovely. Thank you. Um, another question. With the work going on in feed conversion efficiency, will we see EBVs for this? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, um, th there is some work ongoing looking at, at feed efficiency uh, and a residual feed intake, so the amount of feed required to produce a, a, a kilo of beef. The key bit with all these things, we can produce EBVs for most things if there's a genetic component, but what you need to do is get really good measurements, and the process of getting measurements takes time, and the challenge with feed efficiency is it's very expensive and time-consuming to actually get those measurements. But we're in a great position in, in the stabilizer breed where we actually think we've got those phenotypes. There's some early work that's been undertaken that shows that there's quite a good heritability for the trait, so we can make quite fast genetic progress and they've structured what they've done really well so that they've got lots of different sires represented uh, on the project so that the information will feed back well. So, yeah, we're just in the, I mean, we're, I think we're months away uh, yeah. from actually having an EBV for that uh, particular trait within the stabilizer breed. There's also a DEFRA-funded project uh, that is in, will be testing uh, Limousin and Aberdeen Angus cattle uh, and again, that's again that's starting from scratch because we didn't have these measurements before. But again, collecting that data so that a we have knowledge about how to collect feed efficiency data and to do it in a cost-effective manner, and mm. uh, with a medium-term aim of actually having an EBV for that. Lovely, thank you. So the next question comes in two parts. Um, so how do you work out the EBV for lifespan, and can TB unfairly affect that EBV? Uh, the lifespan EBV is, is interesting. We're, essentially, the measurement that we use is between when the animal is born and the last known calving event. However, for younger animals, obviously, they're going to go on and, and keep producing calving events. So we do some some specific maths in the case of those animals so that they're not disadvantaged. In other words, so they don't look as if they've got a very short lifespan. Um, so it's particularly useful for the older animals in the population. And then we actually take into account the probability of those younger animals going on and having successive carvings. And as with most things within the bluff analysis, it's a contemporary comparison between sort of cohorts of young heifers born in the same year on, kept on the same farm, given all the same chances, some will go on and have a long lifespan, some will tend to go on and have a, a short lifespan within the herd. Mm. Um, the TB question, I, I suppose it, it will tend to get wrapped up within that, that lifespan. So animals that leave the population um, because of TB, that will tend to be reflected as part of, of lifespan. Lifespan is sort of trying to capture a whole range of different traits, whereas obviously TB is one that is quite specific. Interestingly, in the, the dairy analysis, I believe I'm right in saying there's a small positive correlation between their lifespan EBVs and their TB advantage figures that come out. In other words, in the background, um, they're selecting for, they may be selecting for similar genes in the background. Lovely. And can you see that uh, TB advantage uh, EBV being available in the beef industry? 
there's certainly quite a bit of interest in it, um, and obviously particularly in areas that are most greatly affected. Again, what you need is large data sets, and that's why it was logical to start with Holsteins, because there was a large data set uh, that could be accessed through BCMS and through pedigrees that are available. And yeah. there's a large number of, of phenotypes, so, that, so the, the phenotypes or the measurements that are used for TB Advantage uh, are the skin tests, and so that skin test data um, could be used. And uh, so there's, there's two elements to the question. One is seeing whether the data sets are big enough and robust enough to do it for beef breeds, and it will inevitably be easiest with those that are largest or where there's uh, most numbers of animals affected in a, in a contemporary group. And then secondly is, is, is just working out the mechanism of how you actually deliver that, um, recognising that there's several different genetic evaluation services available, um, many of them being run directly by breed societies. So breed societies, it's logical, would be, be part of that solution in helping bringing that about. Lovely. Thank you. So another question. Uh, what advice can you provide to a breeder introducing new breeding lines into the UK from, say, France or Ireland? Yeah, that's a, a good question, um, because that's always the challenge. You bring something in that's quite exciting from outside, and then it comes in with a sort of a group average figure, because we really don't know anything about its performance, unless it's already got some relatives in this country. So the key bits to think about are to give as full a pedigree as possible because it might have links to brothers or sisters or um, you know, a, a sire perhaps that's already recorded in this country. And then it's to try and get its progeny well recorded against another animal that we know quite a lot about. So rather than the farmer perhaps having you know, 30 calves just in his herd in isolation, He'd be better off perhaps having 15 or 20 calves by this bull and, let's say, 10 or 15 by another bull that's really well known. And then the analysis can very quickly pitch one in against the other. Right, OK. The other, the other thing that you can do is to get that, those genetics used in more than one herd, so you're effectively you're testing animals much quicker. But I realise there's disadvantages in that, because it means you're sharing these, these unique and special genes. And sort of the last bit is the thing that I wouldn't do, which is to take a, a sort of a, a scattering of lots of different straws of semen from lots of different bulls and getting one or two calves from each of them, because the, that becomes much more difficult for the analysis if they're all unknowns to truly pick out differences that relate to the sire, because it's essentially being tested on one or two calves. So I, I would always try and get you know, a, a dozen calves on the ground, fully weight yeah. recorded uh, as a sort of minimum if you really want to see how good um, he is compared to some others. Lovely. Um, a similar question to that. Um, how do cattle get EBVs when they've never been measured? Uh, someone has seen calves with full sets of EBVs which have never been measured. Yeah, they will... As soon as they enter the analysis, they'll get information which is basically mum plus dad divided by two. And if they've got half their genes from mum and half their genes from dad, that's the best prediction that you can make at that moment in time. But obviously, we haven't got any data on how the animals actually perform. So the accuracy figures will always tend to be much lower at that moment in time. But you could argue that's better than um, you know, just buying completely blind it's useful to know what mum and dad have done and so to have an indicator of likely performance. But I would always be chatting to the vendor to actually make sure that they are actively weight recording and also that they're actively involved in ultrasound scanning. If you're interested in carcass traits, you want to know that that animal's actually been measured in the background. Yeah. And just the final question. Uh, somebody's read a lot about a project to produce carcass trait EBVs. Can you tell us a little more about this work? Yes. Um, yeah, it's quite an exciting piece of research. Obviously, in this country, we can only ultrasound scan a, a certain number of animals in pedigree herds um, each year. But by linking some large data sets together, we can access some really useful information. So what we've done is we've linked 
this is through work, I should say, that's been undertaken by SRUC and funded by AHTB Dairy, uh, as well as HCC, as well as AHTB Beef and Lamb. And they've linked the BCMS data set so that we know about the relationships between animals. So all mothers and some sires, and I'll come on mm. to that in a moment. And then also data from the abattoir sector. So we have lots of data on carcass weight, carcass confirmation, fat class. And from that, we can actually do a multi-breed analysis and tease out um, quite good heritabilities for traits like carcass weight, carcass confirmation, and fat class, as well as um, days to slaughter. So we can identify animals that uh, can finish more quickly. So that's quite a powerful piece of research. We're just in the process of sort of turning the wheels for the final time, looking at the model in a little more detail, uh, in part in terms of how it deals with hybrid figure, because that has to be built into the analysis. And then we'll be in a position to go out to industry and to the individual breed societies and to say to them, look, AHDB uh, and, and friends can actually produce this information for you. How are we going to get it out there and used by the, the wider industry? Because it's potentially really quite useful information. Mm. The one bit that would make it even more useful is if we had a higher proportion of sires recorded correctly on the passport. Um, so although typically at the moment, what do we get, about a third of them where sire is, is recorded on the passport, mm -hmm. if we took that up, then this becomes even more valuable. But even at that level, because we're accessing millions of records, um, that data is extremely valuable. Lovely. That sounds really interesting. Look forward to more updates from that. Um, so just a reminder that you can request the expert view sheet which Sam has prepared by emailing brpconf at ahdb.org.uk. So the next teleconference will be held on the 4th of March at half past one and Alwyn Jones from SAC will be talking about calving the cow. Finally, I would just like to flag up our Bee Feeding Club e-newsletter. So this is sent out bi-monthly and aims to provide farmers with the latest news and interesting information about feeding cattle. Please let us have your email address if you would like to receive this. Email brp at ahdb.org.uk and ask to subscribe. So it doesn't look like there are any more questions coming in, so I'll bring the teleconference to a close. I would just like to thank Sam very much for his very informative teleconference today and I hope the listeners found it both interesting and informative. Thank you very much.